This is good light. Okay, this is the camera. So to the best that you can look there, the, that. I agree that reality is insane. <laughs> so, the, to the people that want to say like, oh, what you, what you do, that's not real. That's so weird. I just feel like reality's freaking weird. Yeah. Reality's. Cr look out your window. Is that any more strange? Yeah, you get in Less a metal strange? box and drive to a building filled with people you don't know <laughs> working for someone you probably don't care about yeah begging them basically for a salary using your time and energy and effort that's insane to get money that's totally that crazy. you go to a store and buy things that you don't want or can't afford or don't need to impress people you don't know and probably don't like sidebar this is just gonna sound totally this is a terrible this is an on video confession that's not gonna make it into the actual video but I need to get it off my chest. And that is that I was watching a video of somebody that had their whole house destroyed by the floods. And they were going through like all their things, <clears throat> like opening drawers and the drawers were just full of water. And something in the back of my mind was like, there's something that doesn't sound so bad about that. Like yeah. we're just gonna strip all your possessions away. And I was thinking if that happened to me, what would I be sad about? And there's yeah. that thing about like, oh, save the family photos, you know? Yeah. But it's just so interesting too that that's like the important thing. It's like totally. the photos, the, the ephemera. And I have, having moved so many times over the past five years, I have everything that I really truly treasure is down to like eight to 10 boxes. You boiled it down. Yeah. And it's amazing to me when I was in Brooklyn. I was in Brooklyn for five months and I found even more stuff to get rid of when I left. How many moves have you made in the last three years? In my lifetime. And I count, so just to clarify, like I count when I was a kid and we moved. Mm -hmm. And then I count any time that I've like couch surfed with someone for more than six months, I consider that a move. So those are my qualifiers. Mm -hmm. I think this will be, back to San Francisco, will be my 32nd or 33rd move in my life. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's intense. Yeah. I think oh. I figured it out. I spent an average of 16 months at a place. Okay. Man, I am so sedentary. I, I never, I, I, it takes a crowbar yeah. and some really serious um, circumstances, circumstances <laughs> to get me out of a place. Well, let's do a little intro. Okay. Well, it's weird because I'm a Virgo too, like major Virgo. Like mm -hmm. that, I should be earthed and grounded and I'm not, but I am now. Well, things also need to be right. And if mm -hmm. they're not right, then... <laughs> then I'm gone. Yes. <clears throat> Hi guys. Welcome to the 22 Teachings channel. I'm Naha and I'm a very, very special guest. Andrew Martin, I know some of you guys may know him and watch his channel, which I will definitely link down below. But Andrew and I have been friends for what, 20 years? 20 something, something yeah, early 90s. Yeah. yeah. And he's here in LA, so I wanted to bring him on and ask a few questions. So thank you for being I here. I am so happy to be here. Are you kidding me? It's amazing. We were just talking before the like before we recorded how it's just so crazy that we've known each other for so long. Yeah. And have literally lived like five lives, at least, each of us in that time. And now to see each other on the other side of all of that drama and be like, nope, it's good. I made it through the wilderness. <laughs> I know. Who would have thought? I mean, at the time that we met, what you were, you were a makeup artist, mm -hmm. right? And I was rolling burritos. At I was a makeup artist in a drag queen. Kitchen. Okay. And doing yeah. drugs like they were going out of style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now. We call that our wild stallion days. Yeah, completely yeah. free and untamed. Completely, <laughs> yeah. And then for us to both have gone in different directions to different cities. Mm -hmm. And well, I stayed in Seattle, you left. You've been to New York, to San Francisco, to LA, back, back to, to Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. Um, and you've really been making the rounds. And um, now I'm here in LA and we've reconnected since we're both in this place where we're doing to a certain degree, very work in a similar vein, which mm -hmm. is really looking to work with clients and empower people yeah. and and spread the message of uh, something bigger than what I think 
either of us would have thought that oh my life God. was at one point in time. There's no way. There's no way. And I consider myself to have always been fairly imaginative and have a pretty free mind in terms of perceiving what may be possible for myself. Mm -hmm. But there is no way if you had told me (laughs) even 10 years ago what I would be doing and where I would be, not only just in my practice and what I do for work, but just in my personal life and where my priorities would be. Yeah. There's no way on earth I would have been able to even come close to predicting it. I know. I can't. I say if you had told me I was going to be a professional tarot reader, I would have said, so I'm going to go off and join the circus is basically (laughs) what you're telling me. Yeah, totally. Um, And I wanted to ask you because for me, if I, if I do think back to sort of the beginning of my interest in sort of dabbling in metaphysical things, Mm -hmm. tarot was my entry point. That was the thing even as a teenager that I was into that later in life kind of you know, that was my gateway drug, I like to say, yeah. um, into the metaphysical. So I'm wondering what was yours? What was your sort of end to all of that? You know, it's interesting. I think I look back on it now and it was a couple of things. I think the big picture is I was just always interested in divination in general. So mm. I had tarot cards. I was into the Ouija board. I remember when I was, this is, and also I, I grew up in a family of musicians and took music lessons my whole life, singing and piano and was in band and choir and all of that. And now my work moving into this sort of sound healing phase, it's so amazing to me to see how even music is a form of divination. Like that to me is what I use to bring spirit through. Mm. But I was just sort of connected to it all and interested in it, but I didn't think it meant anything. I just thought these are what I think I'm interested in. But Mm. I remember when I was a kid, there was this rock shop that lived down at the bottom of the hill. And they sort of like sold like tumble stones. And he had like bigger pieces that, you know, were really beautiful clusters or whatever he had dug. And he used to let us come in and we'd pick up little pieces of gravel and he'd let us tumble them and see what they looked like. And they never looked like anything. (laughs) But I used to go and buy all these little tumble stones. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time my mom had this little Moroccan coffee set that was like a little copper tray. And I bought all these rocks and I just started setting up grids. I didn't know they were grids. And my mom, and I was probably 12 at the time. Wow. And I remember my mom asking, like, what is that? What are you doing? And I was like, they're healing patterns. And she was like, the what? Oh, that's like, so she, and I didn't even know. So I think it's, um, I just always, my entry point was just curiosity mm. and this sense that there was something that I hadn't found yet. Mm-hmm. And I tried a lot of different ways to find whatever that thing was that I couldn't find. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was just curiosity and this like this thing inside of me that just wouldn't keep quiet do you feel yeah. like we bring um from from past lives or from from um some kind of ancestral memories that we bring our knowledge of these things and then we just yeah that's what kind of draws us i do there? and more and more i'm seeing like I begun to view past lives more as parallel experiences and what I see is it's almost like we're kind of it's like a relay baton that we're sort of passing back and forth between our other selves Mm. where it's like I'm going to give you this little bit of information because what I've also started to see in my work is healing for people from this point backwards so they're healing past lives from this point in and then you know sort of going back in time if we're thinking of it in a linear perspective and so i'm very aware that there are other aspects that are like okay well i'm just going to hang on to this until andrew in 2017 is ready and he'll be he'll take care of it for me and then when he's ready for his awakening i'll hand him this baton of stuff that i know that was also him and so we're just going to kind of pass some codes back and forth if that makes sense yeah well let me ask you this yeah do you think that past lives necessarily have to be linear no no. Okay, me either. No. I've actually, through my work, I've, I've felt, I, I've realized or I've, I've had the thought that they don't need to be sequential. Mm-mm. Like it can, why, why does time and space need to apply to something that's beyond the third dimension? Totally. And why not future lives for that matter? I was working on a client and I was seeing what it came through in the same way that a past life would, but I said, this hasn't linearly happened yet yeah. this is actually this person's future life so i'm glad that you yeah. kind of agree with that well that and i don't have seeing, to happen in order no and what i'm seeing is as we're moving out of this lower density and we're moving into higher frequencies time is collapsing like linear time is collapsing and mm-hmm. so what we're seeing is it's actually more like a cube or it's layers and there's different stacks of, of cells and stacks of experiences but they're also sort of parallel so it's sort of like you have 
um, this 360 degree circumference of yourself around you because I've also begun to realize that a lot of what I perceived to be my guides in the very beginning that I would work with mm -hmm. are actually just future versions of me kind of talking back to me, leading me forward. Mm -hmm. So I wow. do agree that it's not like ABC. It's more like Sudoku. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's not a line. Yeah. It's a cube or it's a tetrahedron or whatever. It's more geometric. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And that's interesting what you say about talking to future versions of yourself. And I think when we talk about guides and spirit guides and talking about the higher self and all of these things, um, I, I find that a lot of times, yes, I think that there's guides that are ancestral, but even ancestors, there's still a part of you in yeah. some kind of aspect that you share DNA, you share the bloodline with them, yeah. right? Um, you go back far enough when we're all related anyway. So, totally. you know, I, I find that totally fascinating. And, you know, a lot of my students ask me questions like, where is this information really coming from? And I think <clears throat> in, instead of giving some kind of I have all the answers and I can tell you uh, this is the entire hierarchy of things right. to break it down to something simpler, which is even just is it coming from your higher self or is it coming from your lower self? Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I think it's for also what I'm beginning to realize is that there's biological DNA, but then there's soul DNA. So mm. part of it is I'm carrying the physical carbon stuff from my lineage, mm -hmm. and there's been experiments shown in la you know in laboratory animals that um, DNA information is passed on. Oh yeah. Like and so we know this to be true. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's the combination of and we're seeing this duality collapse as we move out of this linear construct that the, the, the merging of the physical and the non-physical is happening at a really, really rapid rate. So at some point, there he is, Hi. I knew come. you'd come. <laughs> um, I think at some point we're just gonna see a total merging of it, but I do believe that there's stuff I carry biologically, mm -hmm. but then there's also sort of the soul essence or soul, soul DNA. Soul DNA, what do you guys think Ooh. about that? I like the sound Hashtag of that. Hashtag trademark. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions here for you. First of all, somebody was writing in and they wanted to know, um, what do you think about vortexes and can we make them? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, I've never really thought about it before, but I think that we can. I mean, if there's, I believe that vortices exist. Mm -hmm. And if there, everything is a fractal expression, so there's always a microcosm of a macrocosm. Mm -hmm. So if a vortex exists on the macro level, then it absolutely stands to reason that it would be something that could create on the micro micro individual level. Because mm -hmm. what I when I look think of a vortex, I just think of really a a, a, a swirling you know um, like center of energy that is called forth or grounded in or anchored in. And I think that absolutely we can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you you working with energy, you understand that if you really sit in a place and you're focused and your intention is very clear, mm -hmm. you can create a field of energy around an idea or an intention. So, yeah. Well, it's kind of, as soon as you're saying that, it's got me thinking of, you know, watching the, the weather channel and all of the hurricanes that mm -hmm. have been happening and seeing, you know, this shape. And I know that there's conspiracy theories that some of that is man-made versus yeah. that that's a natural phenomenon do you have any do you have any opinions on any of that you know i do and i think that even you know we love to get and i'm the same you know i'm not so much anymore but especially in the early days of my experience i was very much into digging into these conspiracy theories but even that is just a representation of part of the unified whole we, we love to sort of separate ourselves and say, oh, well, there's those dark cats over here and the good guys over here. There's no separation. We're all mm -hmm. part of it. So even if it is man-made, I still believe that it's reflecting something that is present within the one. So maybe I'm using my technology to create a, a hurricane, but that can also become a way to release massive amounts of fear or anger on the planet. Mm -hmm. Right? So nature sort of sees like, oh, here's an opportunity. Yeah, somebody made this, but why don't we just funnel all this funky stuff into it and we'll use it as a way to release. So yeah. I think that we're moving beyond this idea of being manipulated mm -hmm. because I firmly believe you can't allow yourself, you can only allow yourself to be manipulated. Mm -hmm. on a soul level. Maybe not as a human, I didn't wake up and say, ooh, come on, bring on the hurricane. But mm -hmm. on a soul level, there's some sort of agreement that's happening. 
Well, I just find it very fascinating that all of this is happening at this at the same time and that it's also happening in the wake of the eclipses where we've got everybody on the planet that's paying attention, looking at the sky, people that may normally be just going through their lives, not even considering, oh, moon, new moon, whatever, sun, they just like take all of that stuff you know, for granted, yeah. and so to have, you know, I think it creates something powerful just when everybody's putting their focus on the same thing, and now, you know, everybody paying attention to what's going on in the weather, what's going on in the earth, mm -hmm. so it is, it's forcing people to shift what their focus is, and kind of what their sense of, I think, even their priorities are. Totally, you know? totally. Um, here's a question. Um, it, I have noticed for myself that I have a preponderance of female clients and students, many more so than I have male. Now, it's interesting for me because I, my background, my teachers were both men, and the group that I practiced <clears throat> with, my original magical working group, was a very diverse group of both um, men, women, and, and gender fluid people. And so it, it, it has been interesting to me to see, now that I'm doing this as a profession, that it, there seems to be so much more female interest. And even when I go back to the lineage um, that I work in, Western mystery tradition, um, you know, a lot of that was brought forward by fraternal societies, yeah. by the Rosicrucians and Masonic societies, which were all men, um, you know, going back further than that. So I, so I wonder, you know, why that trend is that, that something that was always very much uh, passed down through uh, male students to pupils and then suddenly you know, women are able to have this information and now they seem to sort of have taken it over. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Um, well, it's interesting because most of my mentors have been men as well. Most mm -hmm. of my spiritual mentors have been men. And my clientele has been predominantly female, but more and more I do see more male clients coming to me or more men interested in the groups that I host and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. I think part of it is that it came through a patriarchal lineage just because that was sort of the time that we were in. It was a lot about the oppression, the suppression, and sort of the removal of the female. from. Mm -hmm. So even these, you know, spiritual, you know, fraternities, while they may have been very well-meaning, they were still sort of steeped in that, sort of misogynist undertone sort of thing. And I think it was just sort of by default. Mm -hmm. What I think now is that right now we're seeing, I think energetically the big picture is it is about the return of the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the divine feminine be anchored. We're seeing an balanced divine feminine emerge. And we're starting to see this rising up of feminine energy and not just from biologically a female perspective, but mm -hmm. even within men are starting to feel the rise of the feminine. And what I think is that it is necessary for the divine feminine to be anchored right now, because what happens is when that energy is really rooted and strong, mm -hmm. all of this imbalanced masculine, which is probably 75 to 80% of the male population on the planet, <laughs> is going to need a whole lot of nurturing and a whole lot of love when they begin their awakening process, mm -hmm. and that is going to require a powerful feminine presence. Mm. So I think that this is really women and you know, the feminine within men rising up to create basically this nurturing, safe space mm -hmm. for these really imbalanced masculine energies to be expressed mm -hmm. and to be sort of, uh, what's what I'm looking for, um, resolved. Well, I have noticed that the male students that I have um, seem to be just of this higher level of... Uh, self-awareness and confidence. I yeah. mean, it's something intimidating to walk into a classroom where you have 30 students and, <laughs> you know, 27 of them are women and yeah. three of them are men. Yeah. But the men that are there... Are ready. They are ready and they they just have a certain sense of, like, not being bothered by that, yeah. you know? And and I, I think, like, wow, like, this is really... There's something very powerful in that, and I and I want to see you know a, a greater balance, but I I do think that there there is like 
I said, like, there's intimidation totally in there for for um, for men to be able to feel fully comfortable in that strong female presence. Yeah. And I think we're also starting to see the collapse of the binary gender construct. Absolutely. I think that's part of it because when we move beyond the human experience, male and female sort of collapses in terms of this separate, like, you're a woman, I'm a man. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see that occur because as we move higher and higher and higher, there's less and less distortion and you're ultimately moving back to the unification of all. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that things like, you know, gender and sexuality and, you know, race and, you know, good and bad and night and dark would eventually just collapse altogether. I think so. Yeah. It's funny because in doing tarot readings, people oftentimes ask, you know, okay, you're going to meet this person and they're going to be, they're going to open this kind of door for you. Well, is it going to be a man or a woman? And it, it's funny because, <laughs> well, the, it, it's the energy that this person's going to yeah. have, not what does this person have between their legs. Yeah. I find that to be less and less relevant. And it's funny because it's the same thing that it's a, just a common question. People want that identifier. And it's a similar thing when people uh, want to connect with their guides and they feel the importance of, well, what is, the, what is my guide's name? Yeah. And it just seems like that's such a completely irrelevant yeah. thing. You know, I guess it's like, call them whatever you want. Yeah. Give them a nickname. But people will say, you know, well, but what's their, if I don't know the name, then I can't really know who they are right. or what they are. Yeah. So to be able to release some of these external, um, you know, hello, my name is blah, 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 right. and I am and a man, or I have the blue sign, yeah. you know, and just to be able to recognize, you know, what is the underlying energy of something? What is the, what is the feeling that something has? Even another question that, uh, that I get is what color is my aura? And I think here is the color <clears throat> spectrum that the human eye can see. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> From red to purple. Yeah. Your aura is probably somewhere here. Over here and maybe up here. Right? And, yeah. and totally beyond the the words that we would describe. I mean even even the cats, even a lizard or a, an insect can probably see totally beyond what, yeah. what our logical mind says. Oh, it's got to be red, yellow, or green. Right. And the human mind can't comprehend that there are also colors that we don't even know. Yeah, exactly. We don't have descriptions for. So, so allowing our, our need to, to be able to define things in this very sort of... Uh, rudimentary Crayola crayon compartmentalized yeah. kind of way I think is it's just opening your mind really right yeah it, it was your birthday yesterday yes it was and I want to talk about this because we <clears throat> were talking earlier about cycles um, we you were we were talking about the nine month gestation period and you had mentioned nine um, three times three is nine and the importance of the cycle of three. So, um, and I always think of the cycles of three, cycles of seven, and cycles of ten, just yeah. in terms of years, relationships, human beings. And um, what this is all boiling down to, I'm a number nerd. I love numerology yeah, and I too. love everything about that. And um, your birthday's on the 21st, as mm -hmm. is mine. And Really? Two, yeah, I'm, Aug I'm August 21st. Oh, that's so cool. So two plus one, of course adds up to equal three yeah and then it's also seven times three is is 21 and i feel like i i just feel like there's something about 21st birthdays mm -hmm. i agree yeah. do you yeah okay well and it's also that's where you know it's like it's sort of that's a, that's also where the equinox or the right. you know it's the, always a cut yeah exactly so you're always on the sort of in between two signs so i'm between uh leo and virgo mm -hmm. i'm the last day of leo and then you're the last day of virgo, virgo right libra. virgo to libra so maybe we have some sort of baton exchange that we're passing back and forth that. yeah but i've just noticed uh, a lot of people a lot of really magical people that have 21 birthdays is that my ego noticing that? <laughs> that? well my ego says yes i agree <laughs> yeah so you're on the 
Virgo the end of Virgo side tell me a little bit about how you express through what your sign is you know it's interesting I recently just found out for years uh, because I'm Virgo and I thought I was also Virgo Moon, mm -hmm. but I'm actually, and I thought it was Libra Rising, but I've actually just found out because I was, I don't know where I got it mixed up. Yeah. I'm actually Virgo with Virgo Rising and Libra Moon. So there's this weird uh -huh. sort of triangle thing that happens, and I have almost zero water in my chart. In fact, I don't think I have any. Like I am so freaking earthy and fiery, mm -hmm. which are such conflicting signs in one sense, but they're also like that fire needs the earth to be rooted into something, right? Right. Um, so I think for me, what I see is the older I get, the less Virgo I get, but I also see a huge separation between early Virgos and late Virgos. Like mm. I've had a lot of early Virgo friends who were very in the air. They were very airy and not really grounded in their thoughts. And it was always just sort of, for me, it was always frustrating to be like, God, would you just pay attention to the details, please? Yeah. And I feel that, um, the way that I express myself through my astrological sign or the sort of the, the label that I've given to myself or been given is, you know, I think it's like it gives me a clue perhaps into um, sort of big picture details or kind of how I may find myself moving through a certain cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always paid more attention to the fact that I was born on the cusp or close to the cusp and on the equinox. Like mm -hmm. that for me has always been really important. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know what it means, but I think I've also sort of had this sense of like, it means that I'm magical. Yeah. It means something, like mm -hmm. there's something to it. Um, but I don't know, I find the things about Virgo, like being very focused on health are true, being very focused on details are true, being super earthy and grounded is also quite true. Mm -hmm. And you know, the very Virgo trait of like, if everyone would just listen to us, the world would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you actually, your birthday is at the autumn equinox. Mm -hmm. And I do find this to be such a powerful one. It's the halfway point of the zodiacal year. And, you're, and we're moving uh, from a mutable sign, which is so strange that, that Virgo is mutable. Because, because it seems so it fixed. Does, yeah. Right? <laughs> um, and then we're moving into a cardinal sign. So it's almost being at that cusp it's this this need for allowance for change and then this initiation that comes off of it and i've been finding a lot of that right now where where people are rather than winding down the year mm -hmm. people are actually like now's the time i want to be gearing yep, up totally yeah? fall for me is always crazy busy mm -hmm. like summer for me is always historically and traditionally been just like the chill out incubate take a nap and just relax phase mm -hmm. and i'm even seeing that you know just yesterday you know having conversations with people at house of intuition i'm going to be coming down to do a lot more work with with you guys at i'm um, here in la um, I've got, you know, events and stuff coming up that are just like, it's really starting to ramp up. Yeah. Um, and I also find it's very interesting because my life has been very initiatory. Is that a word? Mm -hmm. And the hermit being the Virgo archetype, you know, in the tarot. And I have my hermit tattoo. And that's been my life. The man who seeks isolation and solitude in the cave to know himself. Mm -hmm. And then moves out as a wizened old man in the later phase of his life moves out into the world now to share that and to hold the lantern for other people. Mm -hmm. And that has absolutely been my experience. And what I love about the hermit archetype and the Virgo archetype is they're both self-contained. And mm -hmm. the idea of Virgo and virgin didn't mean sexually a virgin. It just meant a woman who didn't require a man to be complete. Mm -hmm. And she and the, and the hermit also, like, they're just these sort of these um, ecosystems unto themselves and in order to wield their power, they must first use it on themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have learned is the only way that I'm ever able to help anybody through my practice is because I have walked through my own shit on my hands and knees mm -hmm. in the dark and in the misery of that dark night of the soul and all of that. So now I've looked the demon in the face mm -hmm. and I've given him a kiss and pat on the head and said, I love you. And so now I yeah. can walk with people in that same place. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the hermit... The hermit can only shine his lantern because he climbed the mountain. Mm -hmm. He doesn't he doesn't shine it from the bottom of the mountain and go, "Okay guys, <laughs> yeah. let's go." Right. Right? He he went up there. He he was a seeker, always a seeker, I yeah. believe. Um, and said, "Hey, if this means that I have to do this my own way, <laughs> if it means I have to to hack it up here and 
and MacGyver it up this mountain. Totally. And that's what I need <laughs> yeah. to do. But then the there is so much humility in the fact that the hermit doesn't cover his steps as mm -hmm. he goes and go, you know, this is just for me and I don't want to share this with anyone. It's something that's very freely given to those who have eyes to see, yeah. I believe. You know, we're studying the Kabbalion in uh, one of the classes that I teach and it's kind of the a, an interesting sort of concept that um, truths are secret on one hand, yet they're also freely given. Mm -hmm. It just matters if the person is receptive enough to actually see the truths that are oftentimes hidden in plain sight. Right. Right. And I love that because what I've recently started to really come to in my work is that I require my clients to have something at stake. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is what I know very clearly, especially about those hidden truths, to me, the way that I interpret only those who have the eyes to see is to go through a transformational awakening experience, which we all do in our own way at some point. Mm -hmm. You won't have to give up everything, but you must be willing to give up everything. Like, you've got to lay it all on the altar of yourself mm -hmm. and say, take it all. Mm -hmm. Because I'm at the point now where I don't need it, any of it. I don't want any of it. If, it me if my... My, if the purity of my truth is on the other side of this, mm -hmm. then I will get rid of all of it in honor of that truth. Mm -hmm. And so you do go through that period of feeling like you're losing it all. Mm -hmm. And you do sort of lose yourself and your mind and your attachments. And then on the other side of it, you see what's left. And then you get the fun part of going, oh, yeah, I still want this. I still like this. This is still me. But you can't approach for real transformational healing to happen. Mm -hmm. You must approach it willing to lose everything. Otherwise, yeah. it won't happen. Relationships, even. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, I feel like you are so exemplary of that idea, even in your approach, like with your videos. One thing that I think is set that sets you apart. Now, you have a, a really dedicated and growing following on mm -hmm. YouTube, and your approach has been from the beginning. It's me sitting down talking to you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, with a blank background and it's so funny because I think he doesn't need all the bells and whistles. Yeah. I am very much a bells and whistles yeah. person, you know, <laughs> I want the background and here are all my tarot yeah. cards and this is every rock and crystal. Yeah. And I just think it's so awesome that you can say, I don't need, like that stuff's nice. I yeah. like rocks. I, love I the know bells that you, and you, I've seen your pictures of your citrine. I know yeah. you like those things you said you've always loved you know, cards and divination, but you don't have to, you don't have to throw glitter and, and present it in yeah. that kind of way with all this stuff. Yeah. And I think it's that what I realize now is the stuff is only ever a mirror of what I've got going on inside of me. And the, to me, the purest truths are the ones that always point you back inside. Mm -hmm. I don't need a, a rock isn't going to get me to a place that's going to save me. Mm -hmm. The rock represents what I am capable of, and it is a reminder of that place that I already have within me. And if I need the rock to sort of remind me of that through its vibration or its qualities or its properties, if I need a teacher or someone like you or a client or whoever to remind me of what already exists, that to me is the true nature of a spiritual leader or a mentor or whatever, is someone who just holds up the mirror and says, look, I'm not doing anything other than showing you what you already are, mm -hmm. but you have to be willing to sacrifice your disbelief of that. Mm -hmm. And so I like the bells and whistles, but the, in the beginning, the YouTube channel was a matter of survival. Honestly, mm -hmm. when in the very beginning of my spiritual awakening, which was 2012 here in LA, which is so amazing to me that I've come full circle. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning of my spiritual awakening, I was just, I have to start sharing this because I can't be the only one. And nobody in my immediate life knows even what I'm talking about. They all look at me like <laughs> I just, you know, I'm already the weirdo, but now I'm really the weirdo. Yeah. And so I just was like, I just need to be a voice calling out to find someone else who understands. And I just was driven to it more by means of survival. So in oh, the beginning, you found them. Yeah. You, a lot of people <laughs> understand. Yeah. So it, that is still a common thread in everything I do is I will never go to a place that I or require someone to go to a place that I haven't already been to. Mm -hmm. I can't. To me, it's not genuine. Yeah. There's a lack of integrity there. 
um, you know, it's like the trillion dollar minister in his trillion dollar church mm -hmm. telling people who make, you know, $12,000 a year mm -hmm. to give their money to him and they will save him. No. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it's very true. And I think there's a difference between, there's a difference between theory and practice. Yeah. And there's plenty of people who um, echo and pass along the theory. Like I heard this, I learned this, I took a class on this and I'm going to tell you the information uh, but that's different from actually working it, experiencing it, doing something with it, yeah. living it, and then being able to, to, to teach it. Yeah. So, absolutely. Yeah, and I think there's an integration that comes when you live it first. Mm -hmm. There's an integration that comes that allows you to describe it to people in a very simple, accessible way. Mm -hmm. Because we're in this day and age where these spiritual truths that were so hidden for so long because they had to be, mm -hmm. because the environments that they were in several hundreds and thousands of years ago, it was not safe to be that kind of a person, to mm -hmm. be a spiritual seeker. Right. And so they had to be hidden and they had mm -hmm. to be sort of in this mysterious shroud. Mm -hmm. But now we live in a time where spirituality must be accessible mm -hmm. because we're not the shaman living in the top of the mountain anymore that you have to, you know, seek for three months risking your life to get to. Mm -hmm. That journey is a metaphor for what you have to do internally. But now we're at a time where we basically, what, there's 7 billion people on the planet. We've got 7 billion masters in disguise mm. just waiting to reawaken the truth of who they are. And that's what's going to save the world. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't need to be separate up here anymore. But your journey, ironically, will often separate you from yourself and everything that you've known so that you can get right within. Well, I love that you say that through your own experience, then you can be able to describe things. Uh, in a realistic, succinct, and relevant to the times kind yeah. of way is what I'm hearing too, because a lot of these ancient truths, the the vocabulary that may have even been passed down, you know, through through books and old texts, it it's hard to wrap your brain around it or to read through these really dense things. But once you live yeah. it and you go. I can explain this in normal, everyday, give you a metaphor. I was telling somebody this the other day. They were saying, how do I choose which stone that I, I want? And I said, or which, which crystal could help me? I said, it's just like going to a restaurant and looking at the menu. Mm, you know? I you, love that. You, what sounds good today? Right. You know, do you want a hamburger? Do you, do you want a salad? Like, you can look at that and, and say, like, what sounds good to my body? Yeah. Um, so you can always ask the waiter what they like, but at the end of the day, you're going to pick the thing that sounds good to you. And totally. you don't need to know what all the ingredients are and, you know, exactly, uh, how it tastes before you get it. Yeah. You just like, I, want, I got it because I liked it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And allowing and learning how to trust your own nudges that say, pick that, mm -hmm. pick that. That's what I want. And I love, because in the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning, when I was where it started first working with stones and I'm nowhere near as adept as you are, I just know what I like. Right. Mm -hmm. But that was what I would do. I, you know, there were a couple of stones like smoky quartz and labradorite that, you know, are consistently and carnelian that I consistently mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the beginning it was like, I'm just going to go into the shop. I'm going to see which one I'd like. I'm going to grab it. And then I always found it fascinating mm -hmm. to figure out what it was afterwards and totally. be like, oh, okay, on some level, this must be what I need or what I'm calling out for. And that would give me sort of a little cr a breadcrumb of a little path to follow yeah. rather than waking up and deciding I need to be grounded in my masculine energy. So I'm <laughs> going to go pick hematite or whatever. <laughs> like, why don't you just let yourself nudge you from that non-physical place and then have the mystery of discovery? I love that. So let's go ahead and tell the viewers um, kind of where you are at, how they can find you. And you're going to be coming to L.A. now more yes. regularly, which is so exciting. So exciting. So my website is andrewmartin.energy, and that is my extension. It's not andrewmartin.energy.com. How do you it get is, dot energy? You know, it's that funny. Exists? Yeah, it does. Because when I was getting ready to change my URL, and I'm still in the process of sort of revamping my website and my message, but I... AndrewMartin.com was taken, and there were, I looked at, I know, some photographer out there <laughs> with my name, um, and I was just like going through, I'm like, do I want dot .biz or dot .mobi or dot .whatever, <laughs> but then I was like, wait, dot .energy is actually an that's extension? Thing. That's a thing? That's and I was like, thing. that's kind of badass. Like, I just like the sound of it. So that's my website. All my social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook are all Andrew Martin Energy. 
Um, I am going to be, um, the thing for tonight at HOI is sold out, but I'm going to be coming down once a month to LA working with HOI. I'll be doing clients on Thursdays and an event on Friday nights. So keep your eyes peeled on the HOI calendar. I'll make sure all of that is linked Thank so you. you guys can find um, it. So that you can, you can hook up with me when I'm in town. And then um, I'm going to be in Sarasota, Florida, October 7th through the 9th at the N5D Healing Conference there, which I believe there are still some tickets available. And I'll pass that link on Danaha so that you guys can um, see that as well. And then really, I'm doing most of my clients are remote. Like mm -hmm. the energy work that I do can be done remotely. Mm -hmm. um, so I do most of those through um, video conference or on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be landing in San Francisco. I'm currently sort of a hobo sexual. Like I'm still like, <laughs> sort of like in transit right now, getting ready for my 33rd or 34th move. So I'll be landing in San Francisco in October. I might have a space there to do in-person um, appointments. It's not entirely sure yet, but they can always book through my website and we can do a, a remote session. Awesome. Yeah. That's so exciting. I'm just... I, I, I feel so happy that you were even able to come and do this today. I know you are you're so busy going from here to there and getting everything going on yeah. and you have this exciting event tonight. Which so I'm super excited about yeah. it's gonna be so me much too. Fun. He asked yeah. me if I was gonna be there. I was like, <laughs> well I yes, never want to assume I would not miss it. you know, I just I, to me it is a privilege to have an audience. To me it is the blessing of a lifetime to have people who find what I do interesting or relevant because yeah. I just started doing it because it was the thing that saved my life. Yeah. Like I just did it because I had to and I still want to come at it with that sense of reality and honesty. Like don't put me on a, you know, elevate the message, not the messenger. Mm -hmm. And I'm just a dude who's doing his own thing and trying to figure out this crazy game called life in his own way. So I'm just happy that I can share the things that come through. And when someone tells me like, oh my God, you helped me or, you know, what you said was powerful. I'm like, Wow, that's pretty cool. You are on another level. And you're, two years ago, I got to experience one of your workshops in mm -hmm. person for the first time. And to this day, that is still one of the most powerful guided meditations and experiences. We're sitting in chairs. He's leading us through a guided meditation. And we, I think it was the one where we go up the staircase yeah, it was and we draw the spirit curtain guide back. And, yeah. and, and um, and you said at some point, because I was kind of like hearing your voice and then drifting in and out, and I and I pulled back the curtain and I saw Gandalf, the wizard. <laughs> like, and I remember thinking, like, of course, of course, I would yeah. see this with the gray hood, very hermity. Yeah, hermity. And you said, I and like suddenly your voice was in my ear again, and you said something like. Ask this guide if they are your real guide. Yeah. Or is and ask them, yeah, are you a being, it was something like, are you a being of love and light working for my highest intention? Thank you. Yeah. And suddenly the, the cloak just fell to the ground. It yeah. was not that. And um, this other energy came in, like this dark force, and then I had to call on one of my powerful spirit guides, and there was this whole sort of battle of dark <laughs> and light, and I'm it getting was goosebumps super, like crazy super right powerful. Now. And by the time you said, okay, everybody kind of come back into your body, I was like <laughs> hanging off the chair. My heart was pounding. I was sweating. I almost, I was like, I think I need to lay down on the ground. That was the most intense experience. Yeah. And you, you activated something for me that day. Like to this day, I was like, it was something about showing me the power of my guides and really work I worked through something yeah. super deep so thank you for that and I'm telling you guys if you want you know who needs drugs anymore because <laughs> this stuff is, yeah. is really really can can be so amazing transformative and intense and then real in a way where you can instantly start integrating it and using it yeah. in a way where I have found, you know, using psychedelics, it's always, there's always a separation between yeah. that and then kind of how do I integrate that into my reality where something that comes through meditation or, or through um, some kind of soul exploration, you can instantly start using it. Yeah. You don't totally. have to like take two days to like to come think about back. and yeah and like drink you know coconut water until you're human <laughs> again. Well, what I realize now more and more, especially with my work moving more into this energetic space, is 
that any work that bypasses the level of personality and the conscious mind is so much more effective and efficient mm -hmm. because this is what I know to be true. The spiritual experience has nothing to do with the personality. The mm. spiritual self, the true self, doesn't give a shit what the ego wants, does not care what the personality self wants. Right. That is a choice that we make from our human perspective, and that's important to know who's making the choice, but the energy is coming in because it has its own agenda, which is always just the truth. Mm -hmm. And anything that stands in the way of that truth is what it's going to eradicate. Mm -hmm. And so for your experience in that um, Accessing Spiritual Guidance course, I really feel like a lot of that was you rising up to that place of being rooted in your own power of inquiry mm -hmm. and being able to stand in that place of power and go, no, that is not the truth. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not the truth because I feel it. And mm -hmm. I don't have to tell you why I don't think it's the truth. Mm -hmm. That I, No is a complete sentence. So if mm -hmm. I say no, that doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. I don't need to tell you why it doesn't feel right because it's my energy that's speaking through me. And now it's like, I don't even need to know the why. Mm -hmm. If the why comes, then great. That's awesome. But if it is going beyond the level of personality or conscious thought, that to me is the most trustworthy, trustworthy source mm -hmm. because I know it has my highest intention in, in mind because it's me. It's so nice to let go of the why. Oh my God. It's such a liberation. <laughs> As in a major Virgo control freak, uh -huh. you know, anal retentive earth sign. Yeah. It is so liberating to just realize that the why doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's nice to know information, but it's not need to know. Totally. Yeah. Well, I feel like I could talk to you forever and ever. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, maybe I'll have you on again in the future yes. when you come back down. But thank you so, so much for having this little... Um, tea chat like with tea. me. And I was going to say, stay grounded. And mine mind says, mind. rise and shine. There you go. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. You guys, go ahead and follow him on his channel. I'll give you all, all the information, as I said, down below. If you like this video, please give us a like, give us a thumbs up, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.